All right, travelers, welcome back to Show and Tell with Reach the World. For over 20 years, Reach the World has used virtual exchange to inspire youth to become curious, confident global citizens. My name is Tim, and as part of Reach the World's efforts to support educators and families during the COVID-19 pandemic, we're sharing free live stream show and tell events with members of our global community. You can find an updated calendar of live stream events and much more at athome.reachtheworld.org. For today's show and tell, I'm excited to welcome someone many of our viewers are gonna recognize, Jesse Hildebrandt. Many of you know Jesse as the host of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, but Jesse's also an explorer, a science educator, and a fellow at the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. He's joining us today to talk about a recent expedition to Madagascar, as well as a special project he's working on called Care for Life. To our live stream viewers, please be sure to let us know you're here and share any questions for Jesse using the YouTube chat bar. We'll get to as many as we can today. And without further ado, welcome to Show and Tell, Jesse. Thank you so, so much, Tim. It's a really exciting opportunity to be hosted and to partner with Reach the World in this. We've done so many programs with Reach the World highlighting their amazing explorers with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So it's sudden fun being on the other side of the camera, so to speak. So yes, uh, today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about my own opportunity to go on an expedition. I mainly work in digital education, but I was granted the opportunity last summer to go to Madagascar, a place I wanted to go since I was a little kid. Madagascar was literally the first big word I ever said as like a three-year-old child. It's so phonetic. It's awesome. Uh, so what I'm going to do is share a little bit about my story in the expedition in Madagascar and then dive in with the Care for Life project. So let's bring up my screen and do that. All right. So... Madagascar, let's uh, play from the beginning, perfect. So conservation stories and lemurs are what we're gonna talk about today. So this uh, expedition took place between mid-June and mid-July of 2019 uh, through a, a friend of mine who's a member of the Explorers Club who's done work all over the world and runs a nonprofit organization in Madagascar. And so why go there? What's going on with Madagascar? Well, it has wild wildlife. It is an island that has been separated for about 80 million years from the African mainland continent. And so it's like an evolutionary playground. Some of the coolest animals in the entire world live there that live nowhere else on earth. The top left, you'll see a giraffe necked weevil. This is a bug whose neck is twice the length of its body. My favorite insect in the world. We've got like a lemur hunting super weasel called a fossa in the top right. The bottom left has a tenrec. So this is like a porcupine or echidna hedgehog. You guys might've heard of those. Well, tenrecs are the fourth kind of spiky mammal, and they have up to 35 babies at a time that will literally bite onto mom's tail and trail her like a little furry snake through the bush. So really, really cool creatures. And what I'm really excited about Madagascar are the reptiles. So chameleons do exist in Africa, but more of them exist in Madagascar than anywhere else, including in the bottom right, the pygmy chameleon. So this is the smallest lizard in the world. It can easily wrap around your finger. Just beautiful, amazing animals. But what most people think about when they think about Madagascar is the lemurs. So for those of you who have seen the Kraft Brothers or just in general are, are a big fan of lemurs, they, they seem to be a, something that is really popular to a lot of people. If you've seen the movie Madagascar, lemurs are amazing and they only live in Madagascar. Lemurs are nowhere else on earth. There are over a hundred species from ring-tailed lemurs on the left where the females rule the society. So a baby female lemur is higher in the hierarchy than the you know, strongest, oldest male. Uh, on the right, Zabumafu himself is a Kokoril Shafaka. And we saw him a little bit earlier in my first slide. We'll get back to that in a minute. But lemurs are, are just the most beautiful, amazing animals. And that is one of the big reasons we were there. Another reason we were there is because Madagascar is under threat. So Madagascar is this really unique ecosystem with forests like that in the top left, uh, baobab trees, some of the most beautiful forests in the world, and that forest is being destroyed. Now, it's a very complicated series of reasons why that is, but what it boils down to is poverty. The people in Madagascar are some of the poorest in the world, and what that means is if they have an opportunity to, you know, enjoy a forest or cut that forest down and, and use it as rangeland for their cows or as charcoal that they can use to heat their food, they will do the latter in many cases. And so you can see in the right picture that forest in Madagascar used to cover pretty much the entire country and now is in these small little bands. Um, the, the image only goes to 1990, but it's even smaller now. Uh, it's basically uh, only in the major national parks of which there are a few scattered across the, the country. So it's a difficult situation, but it's another big reason we were there. 
So the journey, uh, I'm in Toronto, which unfortunately my, my uh, cursor won't show on the screen, but just north of the Great Lakes or just east of the Great Lakes in, in Canada, you fly over to France, which is about an eight hour flight across the Atlantic Ocean. And then you get a flight that takes you overnight um, across the Mediterranean, across Africa, the whole continent through the Sahara, the big desert there at the top of Africa. And in the bottom right of Africa, about a thousand kilometers off the coast is Madagascar. So that's another 11 hour flight. So when you leave one day, you arrive late the next day because you're going way east and way south. And it's, it's the longest journey I've ever done in my life. And you arrive at about midnight in Antananarivo. And this is the capital of Madagascar. And it is a huge city. For those of you who are in Canada or the States, uh, it's equivalent in size to about Chicago or Toronto. So it is a major city, over two and a half million people, but very, very different. The buildings are all really short. They're in these interesting pastel colors. They're set amidst all sorts of hills. And it is crowded. And it is an interesting smell. It's a very unique smell in Antananarivo. It's sort of burning rice husk and diesel fuel everywhere. And that's all you smell wherever you are. It actually gives you a bit of a sore throat after a few days. Um, so it's unlike anywhere I'd ever had the chance to be before in my life. You can see in the bottom left picture too, like this is rush hour in Antananarivo. It takes about one hour to drive about three miles or five kilometers. Uh, there are so many people in on the streets. And the cars are, are older. Cars are, are too expensive for most people in Antananarivo to own, so they're used as cabs in most cases, and the cabs are missing pieces of their doors, pieces of the floor, you can see the road go by you as you're driving. Uh, it's a very unique thing and uh, very different from my, my life here in Toronto. But where we were going for our expedition was Ankara Fansk National Park. So this is a nine hour drive from Antananarivo, uh, the most harrowing, scariest drive of my entire life. On roads with sheer cliffs on either side and trucks that pass on blind corners and animals and people in the roads. It was like if Mario Kart were real life, that is what the drive to Ankara Fans was like. My brain basically shut itself off to not process how scary it was. Um, but when we get there, it is beautiful. So on the map on the left, uh, Antananarivo is about halfway through the country, right across from that red and yellow blotch on the, on the far left. And Ankara Fansk is the red uh, rectangle, sort of near the top left there. So you can see where the park is. And it is a dry forest. It is so, so beautiful. The bottom right is the view literally outside of the place we were staying while we were there. So just a, a magical place. And so we stayed there for a few days. We got our gear ready. We got all ready. There were five of us on this expedition and we set out. So the journey, if we go back to the park, was to circumnavigate the park. We did a big loop, about 200 kilometers walking around the perimeter of the park. And our goal was twofold. So we were gonna go to stay in villages every single night, new villages along the path. We would literally arrive with our team, uh, local guides and gendarmes. So gendarmes are like military that would join us and make sure we weren't attacked by bandits, which is actually something that can happen to you in Madagascar. Uh, again, something very different from my experience here in Toronto. And so as we're walking between these villages, what we're doing is, is taking lemur surveys. So we're going into the forest uh, during the day and during the night and using really sort of honed scientific methods, we're walking through the forest really slowly and we're looking for lemurs. And so at night you do this with really powerful flashlights and you look for their eye shine. If you guys have ever driven down a street and had your car headlights on and seen the shine of a, a cat or dog's eyes, it's like that, but we're looking for lemurs. So we'd see what lemur species there were, we'd see how many there were, we charted down. And what my job was on the expedition was to interview uh, elders in these communities. So as I said back in our earlier slide, the forests in Madagascar have really gone down. There, there's far fewer forests than there was, than there is, uh, there's far more forests in the past than there is now. And so my job was to interview the village chiefs and the village elders uh, with the help of a translator to understand how that loss of forest has affected them personally. Do they notice a difference in the number of animals they see? Do they notice a difference in the amount of water their village gets because there's less of a forest to, to generate it? Uh, and it was just uh, such a unique and, and enriching experience. We'll get more to what we found in a minute. But first a little bit about the walk. So as I said, 200 kilometers on this hike took us through all manner of amazing ecosystems. Madagascar is wild. We went through things that looked like dense rainforest jungle. We went through broad flat fields that for 20 miles or 30 kilometers were just grassland. 
like Saskatchewan or Iowa would be. And the grass was anywhere from six inches to six feet high. And I have absolutely no idea how our guides that were taking us knew how to get from one village to the next through this completely featureless landscape. We go through moonscapes where fire had burned away the grass and you could see hundreds of thousands of termite mounds. I'd never seen a termite in my life before this, but in the top right picture, each one of those little pyramids is a termite mound and they would go on for miles. It was wild. And then the bottom left, these are a really unique ecosystem. These are called lavaca. And this is literally where the land has just collapsed in on itself, basically. And so you don't see these coming. You're walking through grassland and you see them when you're about 10 feet away. And it's a 70 foot deep pit that goes for a kilometer scar in the landscape. So these wild ecosystems that you really, this is why you don't walk in Madagascar through the, the bush in the middle of the night, um, because people and animals have fallen in these before. Um, it's something we've actually covered on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and some of our, our past presentations are the lavaca and the amazing ecosystems within. People are what made it though, and this is true of, of, you know, for all of you who are tuning in who have seen other Reach the World presentations, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants presentations, when we have the privilege to travel to places around the world, it is the people that make this expedition possible. So in the top left, you'll see me looking increasingly sketchy on the far left, but that is our main expedition team. We've got some lemur researchers. We've got um, Travis Steffens in the middle. He is the head of the expedition. Uh, and to his left or to the right of the picture is Hassana, who served as translator for me and helping make those connections with local villages. And Jean Paul, who used to be a mayor of a town in, in Madagascar and helped us make sure that the, the communities understood why we were there, why it was so important, the work we were doing, and got people to help us out on this journey. Uh, our gendarmes are in the top right. These are the gentlemen who joined us the whole trip. They started out in army fatigues every single day, but by day four, they got pretty loose and casual and were just wearing slacks and it was very fun. Uh, the communities are amazing. And so you'll see in the bottom right picture and bottom left, uh, Malagasy people were fascinated with us. In some of the villages we went to, uh, we were literally the first white people that the kids had ever seen in their entire lives. And even for the adults, it would be the situation where maybe they've seen 10 people from you know, Canada, the US, Europe in their entire lives. And so everything we did, we were the subject of just abject curiosity. 50 to 100 people, without a word of a lie, would stand around us in a circle to watch us eat, set up our mat, set up our tent, uh, ask questions, want to hold all our stuff. If they got really brave, they'd come and touch us a little bit. I mean, it was a really uh, amazing, unique experience. And so why are we there? Why are we assessing these lemurs? Why are we interviewing these villages? And really, it feeds back into the work of Planet Madagascar. So this is the organization that Travis was founded uh, a few years ago uh, with local Malagasy team. And the idea is, is that in this park, at the very least, we can enact work and work with communities to preserve this really unique ecosystem. We can plant seedlings. So you'll see this in the top right, thousands and thousands of baby trees, and they grow them to the point that they can plant them and build new woodlands. They also work to create fire breaks. So fire is a huge problem in Madagascar. You saw with the, the termite picture earlier, how it took out this huge landscape. Well, if you create a, a gap in, in the grassland, if you burn a gap in the grassland where the fire can't reach, then you mean, it means that if there is a fire, it only takes out one section of the area and not all of it. So they create fire breaks, they do patrols and walk through the forest to make sure people aren't poaching lemurs. Um, and so it's really, really impactful, meaningful work that they're doing. And so it's such a privilege getting to be on this expedition. So if we get the understanding from local villages, if we see how many lemurs there are and what kind there are, that sort of work we can feed back into the national park team and say, look, this is a really biodiverse area. This is an amazing place worth protecting. Can you support us in making this happen? So it was really exciting to get to be a part of that. These are just some awesome photos of Madagascar. So we got the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen in my life in the top left. Uh, Kokoril Shafaka, so Zabumafu in the top right, literally, you know, 10 feet away, looked me right in the eye at some points, one of the most magical animal interactions of my life. Bottom left, we have a gorgeous snake that was right near my tent. And in the bottom right, this is a camp we were in where literally I opened my tent flap door and that is the view out the tent. I mean, I have never done anything like this. The opportunity to get to go on this expedition was nothing short of magical stuff. I just want to share some of those with you. And as I said, uh, most importantly, these expeditions are about people. Uh, without Jean-Paul, without Hassan on the top right, without Mommy on the bottom, who helped organize the whole expedition, this simply would not have been possible. When you're going to the foreign countries in the world, you need support and help of local people. Um, and all these gentlemen were invaluable in making that happen. Uh, again, one of the most amazing experiences of my life. 
So that's the Madagascar expedition in a nutshell. We, we ended up finding a ton of different lemurs. I had some of the most amazing and enriching interviews with the communities who highlighted the fact that it is very different from when they were young children and that their kids don't have the same experiences that they did and they feel less safe because of the situation with the loss of forest. So it really highlights the, the connection of biodiversity in a region and safety, food security, all these other issues that you guys will have learned about on Reach the World's presentation. So really amazing for me. Now, we're gonna dive in with the second part of our presentation uh, before Q&A, and I wanna take us back to the very first photo to understand why I uh, created this project. So, lemurs for me were never an animal that I was particularly fascinated with. I, I love them, I love all animals. I grew up with the crocodile hunter Steve Irwin as my hero, but lemurs never really spoke to me in the way that tigers or gorillas or, or great whales did. And that changed by going to Madagascar. Having one of these amazing animals, you know, 10 feet away, looking me in the eye was impactful. It made me want to share the story of my expedition with Madagascar, like I'm doing today. It made me want to work towards lemur conservation. It made me really care about Madagascar. And so why this is important is it leads into a project that I've created really recently called the Care for Life Project. So just for the next couple of minutes, I wanted to share this with you guys. Basically, the Care for Life project is built around the idea that everyone has living things or living places that impact them deeply. Share those images and stories with me to highlight the fact that, you know, we all have these connections with wildlife. Maybe it's a favorite tree, maybe it's a glade and a woodland that you go in every day to find solitude and peace. Maybe you walk by the shoreline every day and plovers fly up and, and you love to see the seabirds. And so this is the website for the Care for Life project. And there are ways to submit. There are great resources. There's a little bit more about the project. But I want to show you some stories and images today really briefly. And you can check out these uh, later on your own time as well. But we've had stories from kids and people all over the world. We've had uh, documentary filmmakers sending pictures of sharks and what inspired them to become filmmakers. We've had kids like you guys sharing their favorite trees on hikes in Grand Canyon. If we go down further, we've had a mat uh, Malagasy bird from Madagascar from the gentleman who invited me on the expedition, people who love trees like Ken in here, all sorts of amazing stories and really, really different stories. So if you click one of the pictures, you can learn a little bit about why May D in this case, you know, is just fascinated with sea lions. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. You guys can participate by going to the website and you can also check out our social media page. So Care for Life Project is at I Care for Life. We use the hashtag, hashtag care for life. And we've been sharing stories and pictures there every single day, highlighting some other great uh, ecological resources you can find online, uh, all in an effort to inspire people to share those stories. Because I, again, I think they're really meaningful. And if my, my experience in Madagascar is any indication, it can really make a big difference in your life to have these sort of connections with wildlife. So with that, uh, I think I'm a little over time, but I really appreciate you guys tuning in and, and taking part and, and listening to my story. And I really look forward to having any questions you guys might have. Thank you so um, much. That was awesome, Jesse. I could listen to you talking about Madagascar all day long. Um, I'll, we'll pause real temporarily to let our, our online viewers and live stream viewers know that if you have a question for Jesse, please drop it in the chat. I'd be happy to pass it along. Um, I love the, the Care for Life project, Jesse, because I feel like anybody, even if you live in a, a condo in the middle of an urban area, can find some sort of connection to the natural world that um, even if you, th this makes you think about it a little bit harder. Fantastic. Well, thank you. I mean, that's the idea is that, like, I mean, I have reached out to some of my biologist friends and colleagues to share their stories. And I love if people, you know, are so fond of, of the natural world that they start to do it professionally. But everyone has a story. I mean, we've had little kids share, you know, this, their favorite bird or their favorite squirrel, their favorite tree. And that's really impactful to me. And I think that combined with those stories of more professional people and professional photographers, you have a, a really nice diversity of tales uh, that can really impact people. I, I sort of, I dare anyone to go to the site and only look at one story. You're sort of instantly inspired to look at a whole bunch. Um, and that's, what's really enriching for me too. So. Yeah, thanks, Tim. That's awesome. I um, I have to ask a question on behalf of all the Reach the World students who have witnessed a, a video call in which you've introduced them to some amazing explorer or, or new idea. And we don't often get the, the chance to find out more about you as the host. We're usually talking about a special, uh, another special guest. So I'm, I'm wondering how you just generally became a traveler and an explorer. Um, what is it that first got you hooked on, on seeing new places and other cultures? Yeah, uh, well, thank you so much for the question. I mean, honestly, 
honestly, as a, as a little kid, Steve Irwin was my big inspiration. So for the kids who are tuning in now, you might not know Steve Irwin. Maybe you've seen Crikey, it's the Irwins with his family uh, live on TV or on one of the streaming services. But Steve Irwin was an absolute legend in sharing his passion for nature with the public. This is a man who, who lived and breathed the natural world, became a real wildlife warrior, and had an amazing TV show where he was wrangling crocodiles, finding snakes, seeing the beauty in creatures that most people don't. And so from a very early age, I wanted to see those creatures. I wanted to go to those places. I wanted to experience that. And most of all, I wanted to share that passion. I mean, my Christmas lists are David Attenborough DVDs. They're Blue Planet, Planet Earth, um, all these things. And the fact that you can make a living by sharing how amazing the world around you is, is just as magical to me right now as it was when I was four years old. And I'm still privileged to have the opportunity to do it. Um, and so, yeah, it's... <sighs> The world is such a wonderful place. And if you have the opportunity and resources to do that, I think it's really worthwhile exploring it. It changes your perspective wholesale uh, on, on the planet uh, and makes you really inspired to, to do some great work to conserve it. So yeah, that's awesome for me. That's yeah, awesome. so beyond just sort of checking out Planet Madagascar and some of the other resources that you shared, um, for anyone who is watching today or what is gonna watch the recording after the fact, um, what can people do to, you know, from North America, what can you do to either um, get over to Madagascar someday to help out in a, in a real physical way or indirectly maybe some ways that we don't think about that we can, we can help the situation? Yeah, and I mean, this is something that pretty much every speaker that we have on Exploring by the City of Your Pants does, but the first thing you can do is educate yourself. Get books, get resources, go to your local library. library I spent half my childhood, I still spend half my life in libraries. Um, it is so great uh, getting to interact with librarians. You can highlight and find the best possible resources for you. There are more books and websites and everything than ever before to learn more about these things. I really recommend um, Smithsonian. So the Smithsonian organization has some fantastic books on ocean wildlife and on general wildlife. And by reading that, you get to see some of these wild and amazing crazy creatures in the world. Um, and I think that that is the first step towards wanting to protect things, wanting to do um, this work at you know, professionally or even in your spare time. Secondly is, is get out in nature yourself. I mean, Madagascar is a destination that frankly, a lot of people will not have the opportunity to go to in their life. It's a very far place. Uh, it's expensive to get there. We have the luxury of having grants that help pay for our flights to get there. But in your own backyards, when I was 10 years old, in my backyard, I was able to count 72 different species of animal. And I mean, this is something that anyone can do. Go out at night. Here's what you can do to learn more about Madagascar, to get more excited about wildlife. Go out at night. As spring is here, take a flashlight and flash it along your front lawn and you'll see worms, hundreds of worms popping back into the earth. This is true pretty much everywhere you are in Canada or the US. So look for worms at night. And it's that sort of connection. It's that sort of thing that just, it's so invigorating and inspiring to see that, that wildlife isn't 10,000 miles away. It's right there. It's right in your backyard. And I think that's the first best step. If you're keen on Madagascar, Planet Madagascar is an amazing organization. Uh, National Geographic, World Wildlife Fund, there are some great groups that do conservation work in Madagascar. And the benefit of Madagascar, as I said, it's a, it's a very poor country. And so conservation work, the money for conservation work goes a lot further there than it does in most places. A thousand dollars pays for a ranger to do patrols for an entire year in Madagascar. So whereas in most places that would, you know, be a, a week of work, in Madagascar that's a year. You can save tons of wildlife and really promote community conservation with very limited resources. So I encourage you to check that out and see how you can contribute to some great organizations. Hope that helps. All right, yeah, fantastic ideas. Um, I, you get the chance during the course of your work to speak with a lot of explorers and being an explorer yourself, what does it mean to you to be an explorer? It sounds like one of those like mythical jobs, um, <laughs> but what is like in, in today, what does it mean to be an explorer? Yeah, I mean, it's funny, and I think that I'm going to say the statement that a lot of, uh, of other people who have the chance to explore do is, is it's like, you don't feel like you're an explorer, it just, <sighs> but I, I appreciate the sentiment. So <sighs> it's to, you know, it comes back to the perspective thing to me. I think to have the opportunity to go places or to interact with people that share uh, a larger perspective of the world, to make the world seem like a place that is ours. I mean, I feel at home, I, I'm very fortunate and I, I've traveled quite a bit in my life and I feel at home everywhere. This is our planet. It's not just Toronto, not just Canada, not just, you know, anywhere I go internationally, I feel at home because there's this human community there. And that's the biggest thing for me as a person who's had the chance to travel and explore 
through the Madagascar expedition is that it's amazing how similar people are all around the world, wherever you go, how similar their motivations, how similar their goodness, um, their desire to do good things. And that's the, you know, as much as it's wonderful to see amazing cultural differences around the world, that's been the biggest perspective change for me is that, you know, I care so much more about wildlife in other places, but I also care so much more about people in other places because of the perspective that adventure and, and exploration has given me. And I think the, the key point of being an explorer now is certainly there are places that we haven't explored as a species and there's, there's new frontiers to, to get to, but I think the biggest uh, requirement of people that get the chance to explore is to share that work with people who might not have that chance or to inspire people who are young uh, to encourage them to do that. And again, that can be through a library. That can be through a trip to your backyard. It can just start on the path of seeking to understand the world around you and people around you. And that's the, the biggest benefit you can have. And I think as an explorer, that's my favorite part of the, the gig. Yeah, I like. I think it's worth sort of looping back around to the fact too that even though you have a, a real big focus and interest in science and STEM related topics, mm -hmm. um, on this expedition, you were storytelling, you were, you know, it was a, it was, you did not have to be a scientist to do travel or work in conservation. Right. And I mean, this is true for whatever field you're interested in. We have a lot of uh, a NASA scientists on our program and every single one of them to a person says, look, if you're interested in NASA, and this is true, if you're interested in National Geographic, if you're interested in being a government agency, you do not need to be someone who excels at the top of your class academically. I mean, I almost, almost by the skin of my teeth, passed math in grade 12 and passed math in first year university. It's hard. Um, and so I was never going to be a top physicist, but this uh, field, this work allows me the opportunity to do all sorts of other things with regards to storytelling that are really exciting. So if you want to be involved with one of these organizations, there's so many ways to do it, whether it's a business person, a lawyer, an artist, a cook, uh, you know, what have you. Ships that go to the Antarctic, Places, expeditions that happen in Madagascar, there are translators, there are field porters, there are cooks, there are all these jobs and gigs that allow you to enrich yourself and have these amazing experiences without being a top scientist. And I mean, I don't claim to be a, a scientist. I left after my bachelor's degree. I did not get a PhD, um, but I think it, it's enabled me more chance to tell stories. And I, I love that opportunity. So, yeah. Well, you, you mentioned cooks and I'm curious, what's something delicious you ate in Madagascar? <laughs> in the field, nothing. Um, so I was in Madagascar for 28 days. 14 of that was in the capital or in places where there were people cooking for us. Um, and so at the place we stayed in Antenna Naribo, which works with a lot of research groups coming in, I had some delicious food. Their big thing is vanilla sauce. So that was lovely. Um, some nice steaks, some nice other things. In the field, it's a mix of two things. We brought a lot of our own food with us. So you can have freeze dried food that you, you cook hot water on a pot on a little stove that you, you pump yourself and, and add the gas to yourself. And then you pour the hot water into the food and mix it up. Some of those were good. Some of those were very bad. But in Madagascar, what everybody eats is rice. So it's the, one of the two most, um, uh, two biggest countries in the world for cultivating rice. And so every single meal, Malagasy people have rice. And if you have a plate, like this, the rice will be six inches high off the plate in a mound. And so when I did eat with, with local communities, that was what was on the menu. Rice with a little bit of rocks and dirt thrown in um, because it's hard to get out sometimes. Yeah, not, not a culinary destination, it's right. Madagascar, virtually. <laughs> well, this time has absolutely flown by and I know that um, we're gonna, in addition to the, the solid group that's joined us for this live stream. A lot of people are going to find this recording after the fact. And if we get some questions or, or people share those with us after the fact, I'll be sure to pass them along to you. I really appreciate you sharing all of your experiences with us. It's fascinating to hear about your expedition and your work with the Care for Life Please. project. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much, Tim. I really appreciate that for everyone tuning in. Yes, Tim can literally pass along your questions to my email address. I'd love to take questions and field them. Uh, and if you get a chance to check out careforlifeproject.com, submit some great stories and images, and I'd love to get them up on the site and keep the, the amazing, inspiring uh, learning going. So thanks, Fantastic. Tim, for the opportunity so much. Yeah, you bet. Before we go, though, I always ask our show and tell participants uh, yeah. a final question. Once you get released from quarantine, where are you going to go or where do you want to go? 
I'm going to go to some local restaurants to support them because they're struggling and it's the very least I can do to, you know, help contribute to their, you know, amazing work. All of us get this chance, you know, when the world is normal to go to these places, coffee shops and restaurants to interact with our friends and family, uh, to, you know, work with businesses in the local community and those businesses are struggling. So wherever you are in the world, go to local restaurants, stay safe, wash your hands, of course, uh, but eat heartily and, and hang out with friends and family. So that's where I'm going. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to that for you and for me and for everybody else who's stuck inside. Uh, I want to thank you again so much, Jesse, and thank you to our entire YouTube live stream audience for joining us today. You can join us again for several upcoming events uh, this week, and we've got a great STEM week coming up next week. Uh, the full lineup of Reach the World live stream events is always available at athome.reachtheworld.org. Thanks, Jesse. We'll see you all next time. Thanks, Tim. Bye for now. Mm-hmm. <laughs>